Good afternoon, folks. My name is Mustafa Ninusa, and welcome to Blacks Law Matters. I know what you're thinking. Black Lives Matters. No, Blacks Law Matters. That's a little double entendre, tongue in cheek. It's one of those things. I'm not sure which one it is. But what I'm hoping to do is to introduce people to areas of law, whether it's the law, court decisions that impacts their lives, especially given the current circumstances. So the first thing I want to talk about is a doctrine of qualified immunity, something that you might have heard of already or you might be hearing about, but I'm sure at some point you probably will hear about qualified immunity because it's very important and very critical to, to some of the events that are happening uh, today. But before I get into qualified immunity, let's talk, maybe the best way to understand that is to look at another type of immunity, absolute immunity. What is absolute immunity? Well, that's the one that the presidents have. I'm sure you've probably heard the president, a, a sitting president cannot be sued. Uh, you can't prosecute a sitting president. That's because of absolute immunity. As long as the president is acting within his or her capacity as president, can you imagine if the president, well, maybe some people would like to see that, given our current president, but can you imagine the president gets sued left and right because of the decisions that he or she has to make? That may not be the best way to approach things. So that's why we have absolute immunity. Diplomats also, to a large degree, have absolute immunity, at least in the country that they're in. That's why you've heard those cases where the diplomats are in New York, they get parking tickets, or maybe they even do something even more heinous than just a parking ticket, and nothing happens to them. They have immunity until they go back to their home country, and then you know maybe something will happen to them. Judges also, so Supreme Court judges, um, have absolute immunity. If they're acting within um, their, uh, their job, then they get absolute immunity within the, their capacity as a judge. And if you're just a regular person and you just go out and you want to do something, you want to commit a crime, you don't get immunity. But if you are a political person, um, some kind of government agent, as I said, like a president or a judge, then you get a level of absolute immunity. It's not qualified immunity. Now that we understand what absolute immunity is, qualified immunity is something less in the sense that it's not automatic. You get immunity also, but you have to qualify for it, just like the word says. It's not a job that you qualify for, but you have to be able to demonstrate certain things in order to qualify for this particular type of immunity. So why does that even matter? As I said in the beginning, that's something that we're gonna be hearing about these days, but why is it even important? Well, let me give you a, a, so just a, a little bit of an example of other people besides myself. I'm making this video now talking about qualified immunity, but before I was making the video, other people were also talking about qualified immunity. Two very important people. As I mentioned with absolute immunity, I mentioned Supreme Court justices. Well, in a recent article, it was noted that Justice um, Sonia Sotomayor from the Bronx, something that Cardi B and Justice Sotomayor have in common, they're both from the Bronx. Uh, and then Clarence Thomas, both agree that we need to revisit the issue of qualified immunity. And why is this important? It's not just because Sotomayor says it and Clarence Thomas says it, two justices out of nine in the Supreme Court, but it's, it's arguable that on one end you have the most liberal judge in Sotomayor, and on the other end you have the most conservative judge in Clarence Thomas. So if these two justices on the Supreme Court, social justices on the Supreme Court are saying, you know what, this qualified immunity thing, we need to really revisit it and see whether or not it's even worthwhile us having, then it's probably very important. I will take their word for it. But you have two people from different um, ends of the spectrum pretty much saying the same thing. I would think that that makes it then an important topic for everyone to really know something about, especially, as I say, given the circumstances and the world that we live in today. So let us look at a history, a brief history of qualified immunity. So to understand qualified immunity, you, know, you need to understand like when it's important, when it's impactful, when it comes up. Typically, it comes up in cases that are called 1983 cases. 1983 cases, it's, it's named after a particular statute, and that's important, statute, 42 USC 1983. So back in about 1871, there was a KKK Act. Remember, 1871, we're talking about, what, six years after emancipation? So, you know, KKK was rampant. KKK was rampant even before then, but definitely, you know, after you have a lot of now people of African descent that are suddenly free, that people maybe feel threatened by. So you have the KKK Act, and which sort of morphed into now 42 U.S. 
1983. So whenever you hear a 1983 case, it's because it's referring to the statute 1983. But what that statute allows people to do is for individual citizens like myself, like you, to sue a government entity if that government entity has violated your civil rights, violating your constitutional rights. So you file a case in federal court. You can also file a case in state court, but most of the time 1983 cases are heard in federal court because the federal court has jurisdiction, meaning they have the right to actually hear that case. So you file your case in federal court, it's called a 1983 case. For example, you're arrested by a police officer. You felt that you were wrongfully arrested by a police officer. So therefore the police officer had to seize you, take, take, you know, take your person into, uh, into custody, and that'd be a violation of your Fourth Amendment right. So you felt that that was wrong. And so you sue in a 1983 case for violation of your constitutional rights, specifically your Fourth Amendment right against sort of search and seizure from your person being seized without probable cause. So from 1871 until 1960, or late 1960s, qualified immunity was not part of a 1983 case. It didn't play any role in the 1983 case. If you sued a government agent, if you sued a police officer, or any other state actor, when I say state actor, I don't just mean like the state, like any agency of the state. If you sue a state actor, the state actor was not entitled to qualified immunity. It was, it was never even mentioned. It wasn't part of the case law until 1967 in a case called Pearson versus Ray. And for those who are lawyers that really care, and a lot of people don't care, but the citation is 386 U.S. 547. It's 1967 case, Pearson versus Ray, went to the highest court in the land, the Supreme Court of the United States of America. So what did the court basically say? This is when the creation of qualified immunity started. This was the first time. Remember, for the last 100 years or so, there was no such thing as qualified immunity. And then suddenly, it was created by the Supreme Court. And this is one of the objections that Clarence Thomas has to qualified immunity. He says, this is not law. This is something that we just created out of thin air. Now, there's some good to that. Sometimes judges do create things sort of out of thin air. And there's times when it's actually positive, when it's sort of needed, because the law itself doesn't say you can do something. So out of case law, the judges create something. But that's basically what happened here with qualified immunity. And what they said in that case in Pearson, just briefly, that if a police officer, uh, in the context of a false arrest, this was, I think, Pearson dealt with false arrest, if a police officer had a good faith basis for arresting somebody, they subjectively believed that what he or she was doing, and they were rightly arresting someone, then they should be entitled to qualified immunity. So that the police officer can demonstrate that he or she subjectively believed that what they were doing was right, then why should they be punished? That's really sort of the, the, the wisdom behind it. You, you want to protect the police officer so that he can do their work, so that they can act appropriately, believe in some of the things that they believe based on the facts and the circumstances that are around. The court then went and extended qualified immunity beyond just false arrest and false imprisonment cases. In basically any case where you have a state actor, a police uh, officer, or some other governmental agency act, then they will be entitled to qualified immunity if they can prove that they had a good faith basis for acting in the manner that that person acted. Then 1982 is when we shifted even more towards heavier, if you want to call it heavier, qualified immu immunity, more qualified immunity. And that was in the case of Harlow versus Fitzgerald. Harlow versus Fitzgerald, H-A-R-L-O-W versus Fitzgerald. Again, for those lawyers that really care, the citation is four, five, seven, U.S. 800. So how did this change qualified immunity? Well, before it was a subjective view of the officer. Did the officer subjectively believe that what they did was right? Now you could question that and say, well, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, what you did, you knew that that was wrong. Then it turned into an objective test. And what that means is not whether or not the officer, that particular officer, what they believe was right or wrong in that moment, but what a reasonable officer in that situation would believe. Now, this is what that means, I'm not really sure, and that's part of the problem that many courts have seen with 
qualified immunity. And there's another one that I'm going to talk about a little bit later. But what would the, a, a reasonable officer in those particular circumstances believe um, was the right thing to do? Or whether or not a reasonable officer in that particular situation was acting rightly when they arrested somebody or any other action that the officer might have taken. So now that we've gone over the history of qualified immunity, what is the standard for qualified immunity? I think the best way to start that off is by reading you what qualified immunity is. And this is what it says. It says the doctrine of qualified immunity shields public officials performing discretionary functions from civil liability, not criminal, from civil liability in so far as their conduct does not violate a clearly established statutory or constitutional rights of which a, uh, a reasonable person uh, would believe the act did not violate those rights. So again, it goes back to the whole idea of it has to be a reasonable person. In this case, a reasonable person is really a reasonable officer in that particular circumstance. Now you might be thinking, well, that's officers reasonable? Well, that's the standard. It's a standard that's used in a lot of different instances also. What does a reasonable person do in this particular situation? In this particular case, because we're talking about police officers, if what a reasonable police officer would do, or what a reasonable agent, that particular type of agent, would do in that particular situation. Now, the one part that I read just now that's even more critical is the clearly established law section. So what, is, what does this mean? So if you can kind of break down what I just read, there are different components to it. So one point, component is you need to, uh, to, to qualify for the, sort of the qualified immunity in order to be able to sort of shield yourself with it. It's not something that's automatic. You need to be able to demonstrate that you have probable cause. The officer would have to do that. So if an officer sees somebody walking down the street, person's not doing anything, just walking down the street, it stops the person, like, like the stop and frisk cases that have become very popular. No probable cause, that's sort of the easy case, like, ah, there's no probable cause. Why did you stop this person? If you can't demonstrate that you have probable cause for stopping a person in a false arrest case, then you're probably not going to get qualified immunity because any reasonable officer would know that you need probable cause to stop a person that's not doing anything. I'll give you another example. You see somebody, um, in, in the most recent case, you see somebody I don't know, slashing a tire somewhere. An officer actually sees somebody slashing a tire. Reason to believe that maybe that person has committed a crime. And that's really what probable cause is. Reason to believe that a crime has been committed. If the officer arrests that person, I think that pro uh, officer probably has a very good chance of getting qualified immunity. But let's say later on you find out, well, the person was actually not vandalizing or a slash in a tire, that was their car. There was a reason, an actual reason why the officer was doing that, but the officer didn't know that at the time. Maybe the officer should have asked, but you know, I'm giving you a very simple example, but maybe the officer should have asked, is that your car? But let's just say the officer didn't, and there was no reason for the officer to ask any further questions based on what the officer was able to see uh, him or herself. So that's, a, that's an easier question where you can see that probable cause exists, and the officer will probably get qualified immunity. Let me give a third example. It's like actually a real example that went all the way to the Supreme Court, if our memory serves you right. Right here in the Southern District, can't remember the judge's um, name, but the case was in Washington Heights. Police officers saw in the early morning, they saw some, uh, some right, minorities, let's just say, putting things into their car, into their trunk. When they saw the police officer, when these individuals saw the police officers, they took off. Police officers chased them and arrested them. Hmm, was there a problem with cause? What did they do? What did these gentlemen do? They ran. What did, when they ran, were they doing something wrong? Or were they just fearful of police officers? So one of the judges at his, uh, the Southern District, I believe uh, his ruling was, well, in, in that particular area, running from a police officer by itself, it's not suspicious. If I was in that area at that time, I would have ran from a police officer. It's pretty much what the judge was saying. But again, it went to the Supreme Court, and I believe the Supreme Court reversed and said, no, you know, only the guilty fleeth, I believe was one of the lines from that particular case. Maybe it was a different case, but you get the idea, right? They flee, you must be guilty of something. I think it, it was later discovered that maybe they didn't even do anything wrong, but 
you sort of get the point. That's a little bit more of a gray area where it appears there might be probable cause, or was the person really doing something? Did you chase after them because they were minorities and you believe they must have done something wrong? Whatever the case might be, that's a little bit of a trickier case. So the other sort of thing that is not written in what I read to you in the description of qualified immunity um, is when you're talking about a reasonable officer, interestingly, the, what you need to be able to show is if you took 100 officers and you asked 100 officers whether or not they would have done the same exact thing, and you get one officer to say, I would have done that differently, then you get qualified immunity. If you get 99 officers, sorry, let me go back. If you get one officer saying, I would have done exactly the way this particular officer did it, then you get a qualified immunity. But if you get like 99 officers and they all said, no, I don't think I would have done that. No, no. But one officer says, yeah, then it's reasonable. A reasonable officer under those cursed circumstances, we got one out of 99, that sounds crazy. One out of 99 says, yeah, you know, I think I would have done that. Then you might just be entitled to that qualified immunity. And now the clearly established law is where it gets really tricky. Because for example, a chokehold, is that clearly established law that you cannot chokehold or some a person? Who knows? And I, I'm not sort of being facetious about it, but that's really the nature of the law. What the law in a way requires is that in a particular situation where an officer is asking for qualified immunity, you have to be able to demonstrate to defeat that, that there's a situation just like that one, almost exactly like that one, that is so clear that this officer knew that his or her action violated clearly established law. That's why I use the chokehold example. So if you use a chokehold, officer could say, well, there's no other example like this where somebody uses a chokehold. How would I know that that's clearly established? Now, to the layperson, you might say, oh, come on, come on, you knew that was wrong. Come on, you knew, you know, taking this particular action that was wrong. But it's a clearly established law. That standard is not what you as a layperson might think it is. It almost basically requires you to show that it is an identical case, just like yours, where the same thing happened. And therefore, it is clearly established that the action of the officer is wrong. And that particular area is really the one that is the battleground for qualified immunity. That whole requirement that you have to demonstrate it is clearly established law, because who knows? There's so many cases, and every single case is different from the next. If you're gonna require that the cases look exactly the same, you're not really gonna have um, a fair fight when it comes to being able to defeat an officer that wants to shield him or herself with qualified immunity. So, as I said, Clarence Thomas, Sonia Sotomayor are both interested in reversing that. There are cases before the Supreme Court that are going to contest whether or not qualified immunity is a good idea. Uh, and if it's reversed, we don't know whether the uh, Supreme Court is going to con um, entertain that. But if it's reversed, we have to ask ourselves, well, what really changed? If we say qualified immunity is no longer valid, it's not a good idea, it's not a good doctrine, but what changed? Is it simply because people are out in the streets and there's a whole ruckus about police brutality or police action? That's what changed? Well, there was a ruckus about police brutality years ago, 20, 50 years ago, but it didn't seem to change anything. But now suddenly we're going to be changing qualified immunity. So whether you agree with it, you don't agree with it, that's one of the sort of the considerations you have to kind of ask yourself as well. What changed and now we are saying that qualified immunity is a bad idea? And why is it taking so long for people to kind of now take the charge against it? Not to say that nobody has, but now there's a groundswell of a charge against qualified immunity. So finally, I want to talk about um, a representative, Justin Amash. Justin Amash has uh, put forward a bill that is seeking to eradicate um, qualified immunity. Now remember, qualified immunity itself is not even a law. Law meaning it's not a statute. It is something that grew out of case law from the Supreme Court justices. And that's how it, it sort of lends itself to its own existence. But now uh, the House of Representatives, Amash, I believe from Michigan, is seeking to make that law 
that a police officers are not going to be entitled to qualified immunity, not going to get that as a defense, and that the standard requiring um, the, the, the conduct be based on clearly established law, that that's also going to be eradicated and pretty much is going to put an end to qualified immunity if it makes itself to the Senate and it's ratified and then goes to the president if he does not veto it. So that's what I wanted to share with you. That's something that's going to be uh, very important in light of the things that we are going through uh, these days for people that might have uh, been wrongfully arrested, uh, wrongfully detained, uh, wrongfully prosecuted. Uh, if you want to bring a case against uh, officers or other government agencies, this is something that is of concern. To put it in another way, imagine if, you know, if the prosecution or the plaintiff and the defense attorneys were just dueling, and both parties have a sword and they're dueling, and then suddenly qualified immunity appears as a shield, and you don't have one. They have a shield and you don't, and you have to figure out how to pierce that shield. Initially, that shield was probably just made out of wood. And then by the time it gets to 1982, that shield is made out of platinum or gold or something, some impenetrable um, um, element. That's the situation that we have today. With qualified immunity, the way it is, it's an unfair fight. And that's not me saying it, that's an unfair fight for the litigant that's trying to seek damages for having been wrong. I'm not saying it. Sotomayor says it. Thomas says it. If they're saying it, then it must be important. So join us next time. I hope to bring to you more information about laws, rules, decisions that impact your lives and impact mine as well. Thank you.